Well, thanks very much indeed, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, once again, this is Jim Ferguson coming to you with another programme about politics and what's going on in the UK and the state of affairs and all of that. So I've got a tremendous guest, and I'm delighted to welcome David Curtin, who is the leader of the Heritage Party here in the United Kingdom. Welcome to the channel, David. It's wonderful to see you. How are you today? I'm doing good, thank you, Jim. Yeah, we have lots going on, but I'm enjoying the sunshine and uh, getting on with politics as well. Yeah, wonderful, David. Well, I've been looking forward to speaking to you for some time. We've spoken off camera a few, a few times before. Um, I've got to say that you are doing an absolutely tremendous job. You're gaining a lot of support, and it's because you're so active, I think, David, apart from anything else, but also your party's policies are, are are really hitting the mark as well. But we'll come to that in a moment. But maybe just for our listeners, could you maybe explain a little bit about your background and what got you into politics? Yeah, I'm not sure how far to go back. I mean, let's go back about 10 years or so, OK, because I was a chemistry teacher. That's what I did for most of my life before I got into politics for about 20 years. But I was concerned really about two big things. Uh, back 10 years ago is that what the EU was doing and how it was taking away more and more of our freedom and democracy. And I was also concerned about political correctness and where that was going and how that was attacking freedom of speech and corroding um, the fabric of our society and just making things, uh, you know, suffocating uh, in the sort of social environment. So um, back 10 years ago, I joined UKIP because they seemed to be the only party that were fighting on those two fronts to come out of the EU and also uh, to fight political correctness. So I joined them for the fight for, for the referendum and for Brexit before it was even called Brexit and uh, fought for the referendum. And then, um, you know, just before then, I was on the London Assembly list. And amazingly, you know, I, I got a place on the London Assembly. So I had that for five years. And then my job for five years was to question Sadiq Khan. Uh, and there's an awful lot to question there because he's terrible. <laughs> so I did that. Um, unfortunately, during that time, you know, UKIP, which which was so fantastic in 2016 quickly collapsed and disintegrated so i stayed in it for a bit but then i went independent and then i started the heritage party in 2020 because we need a party that is socially conservative to do the things which are just our common sense which people everyone 30 or 40 years ago would have agreed is common sense but there was no party standing for those principles which i've now written into the heritage party manifesto so that's a quick potted history of why I got into politics up to uh, what I'm doing now. Well, I mean, I mean, one of the things that strikes me, and it will strike all, all, all of the, the listeners as well, is that you've come from the real world, David. You were a chemist, you know. You've got life experience. You, you, you've had many opportunities to talk to many people about lots of different things in, the, in your previous uh, incarnations of, of, of work. And I think that's what's severely lacking in the UK, because career politicians really don't understand what ordinary people are going through but you certainly do and the other thing i will say to, to, to david is that you you come across as a really nice person but my goodness there is a strength in you that comes through when you're speaking about a subject that you're passionate about my goodness everybody knows it and you stick to your guns and you don't flip flop like a lot of these other politicians when you say something you stick to it don't you well, yeah, I think that what you should do is put everything you stand for right out there, you know, from the very beginning. So everyone knows what you stand for. And and this is the thing I hate about the, the old parties, the, the fake conservatives, as I call them, and Labour, is that they will say whatever they think people want to hear before an election and then they get elected and then they do exactly the opposite it, you know they're all just following the globalist agenda and we know what that is the climate alarmist agenda the woke agenda all of this nonsense you know what uh, you know what really gets me um wound up is when i see this uh 
this transgender stuff and how it's affecting children you know mm. that children mm. are being mutilated let's be honest about it and i'm not I, you know i think we've got to use these kinds of words now yeah. the time has come to stop being polite about this stuff they're mutilating our kids they're grooming our kids they want to destroy children's bodies and children's lives a whole generation in our country and i'm just not willing to put up with that you know what well, i can say whatever they like about me they can call me a homophobe a transphobe i don't care i care about our country i care about our kids you know and i guess a lot of that comes from me being a teacher as well because i spent 20 years you know teaching children i used to teach reproduction because i was a science teacher and chemistry obviously up to a level um ib diploma level i did as well but you know with, with this issue i think it is something now after what happened last week in rye where you heard that recording of two girls being berated by a teacher because the girls were sensible and they wouldn't recognize that their classmate was a cat and the teacher was calling them all kinds of names because she says if you don't recognize that this girl is a cat then you're transphobic and you shouldn't be at this school i mean this is a complete inversion of what should be normal you know and forgive me but i do get uh, agitated i do get passionate about that because it's just insane and we need to stop the insanity you know so but, i think a lot of people would agree with me as well oh i can assure you i can assure you millions of people are agreeing with what you're saying there and it's the teacher that should be thrown out the school not those girls um we're seeing this this it's almost a form of of I don't know, a reprobate mind that, that, that's starting to take hold with people that mm. uh, 20, 30 years ago would have been laughed at, uh, but it's starting to become reality. And the problem, David, is that we've got lawmakers in Parliament, and this isn't just confined to Britain, this is happening in the United States of America and indeed in other places. The wrong types of, of people getting in because the character analysis uh, is not being done when people go to vote. I mean, let's, let's talk about conservative values just for one moment, and you're absolutely right. The Conservative Party here in this country, in the United Kingdom, is no longer a Conservative Party. It is Conservative in name only. They are weak on immigration, they are weak on defence. They are everything about woke and green uh, zealotry, and they have forgotten their principles, core values. And really, the, the people in this country are crying out for somebody like you, David, in the Heritage Party. And there are many other good people, I would say, and they will be coming onto this channel as well. But listen, you're doing a tremendous job. How are we going to get people to understand and wake up that if they've got conservative right-leaning values, voting for the Conservative Party is a complete and utter waste of time because they, and indeed, let's be honest, the Labour Party, they're both just corporate globalists infiltrated deeply by World Economic Forum devotees and they have lost their, their core values and principles a long time ago. How do we wake people up, David? Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. There's no difference anymore, essentially, in policy between the fake Conservatives and Labour. But I think people are waking up already. Or what I'm seeing in the local elections this year and also, you know, the by-elections which are playing out this year is that the core Conservative voters are leaving them. They're just not bothering to turn out because they're like, well, there's nobody worth voting for. The Conservative Party are not Conservative, but they haven't yet come round to start voting for someone else. You know, and what I'm trying to do is create the vehicle for people to be able to join and to stand for and to vote for that will be conservative. So, you know, at the moment, you know, we're, we're three years old. So we're in a battle and it, it's a challenge to, to get the word out that we're here and that there is a party that people can vote for where they can restore our nation and have a government that is going to rule and govern with common sense according to traditional conservative values and so some people are waking up to that you know there's there's more people joining us all the time more people are hearing of us more people are coming out to vote for us the good sign for me is that in the local elections this year we got twice as high a vote share uh, on average as we did the year before so that's a good sign it's still low but it's increasing so it's almost like, you know, um, people need to become aware of the fact that there is a possibility to change things. That's happening. It's slow, but I think it will gather pace uh, the longer we go on.
Well, I, I th absolutely agree, David. And I think, to be honest with you, the reality is, uh, I, I've made a prediction, I've called it, I, I've said that I believe there will be a Conservative Party wipeout at the next general election. I've seen posts by people who are maybe par parts or, or chairs of Conservative associations up and down the country. They're almost at the point of giving up because they know just how angry the public are with this Conservative government and all of their MPs that, that might be sitting there thinking that they are better than everybody else and making decisions that affect everybody else in a detrimental way, allowing woke ideology to target our children in schools and trans nonsense. And this has got nothing to do with e equality. This is about an attack. I would even go as far as to say an attack on humanity itself, David, and it's happening at the global level. Um, I, I, I'm just uh, spurred on by, by some of the, the things you, you've said and, you, and you've stuck to your principles so much. And of course, one of the things that you're known for is your position on the Ukraine war. What's your thoughts on that just now, David? And where do you think we're going with it? Well, when it started, I said from the very beginning, it could have been avoided so easily. And it, but the, the narrative that was presented to us from all the Western governments and NATO and the mainstream media was that Putin woke up one morning and he decided to invade Ukraine just for no reason whatsoever, which is patent nonsense. Because if you go back eight years to 2014, there was a coup in Ukraine. And the American deep state essentially led the West to um, put in a puppet government because the previous prime minister, uh, Yanukovych, decided he didn't want to be part of NATO and he didn't want to be part of the EU. Well, the, the Western leaders, particularly in the US State Department, didn't want that. They wanted to wrest Ukraine away from Russia's influence <coughs> and bring it into the NATO and the EU. So they instigated a coup. They put in Poroshenko, <coughs> excuse me, and Zelensky is just a continuation of that. You know, he was elected in 2019, actually on a platform of peace. He was elected because he said he's going to make peace with Russia. But then, you know, he's the puppet of Victoria Newland and Anthony Blinken and Biden and so ever. And of course, he just went back on his word and uh, basically mm -hmm. stoked up tensions, was poking the bear. You know, if you poke the bear again and again and again and again and again, the bear eventually is going to turn around and get angry and say, well, I'm not going to have this, particularly um, in order to protect ethnic Russians in the south and the east of Ukraine, in the Donbass, who were being massacred by the Ukrainian armed forces, which were full of neo-Nazis like the Azov Battalion. You know, even the mainstream media between 2014 and 2021 were saying, oh, Ukraine's got a Nazi problem. Um, Ukraine's got a far right problem. I think that term's over overused, but they were saying it. As soon as the war or the conflict started, the media turned around and said, oh, well, no, there's no Nazis in Ukraine. And then they said, well, there are a few, but they're not that bad. You know, the whole narrative is complete nonsense. And what we should have done is just stayed out of it, tried to de-escalate it. it. It could have never have happened or it could have been over in a couple of months. Um, yeah. But we've escalated and escalated and escalated. And now there's a big danger of it escalating into a nuclear exchange. And that would mean everyone loses. Well, you're absolutely right. And uh, I watched that whole sorry episode unfold right the way back when the, the protest started to break out, which was a CIA uh, sponsored coup. You're, you're correct in saying that. Uh, one of the other things, David, of course, is that Angela Merkel, uh, and the chap from France, uh, was it Francois Hollande, I think, um, mm. revealed the fact that the Minsk peace agreements, ha they weren't real. They had just done it to give them time to build up their military. How can any foreign power take the West seriously when they're making formal agreements like that only to be found out that they, they weren't going to abide by them? I mean, I don't think anybody can take this, the, this government seriously any longer. And of course, let's not forget Boris Johnson had uh, the opportunity to let that peace uh, negotiations continue but he went over there very quickly probably at the behest of joe biden in the united states and the next thing you know is the war's back on yeah. uh, i wonder uh, david though uh, uh, do you think that we will uh, see an escalation or do you think that that cooler heads might prevail 
what, what, I mean, I think Putin's head is very cool. You know, he, he could have escalated far, far more, far, far more quickly than he has done now. The only reason it hasn't, I think, is because he's held back and he's realized he doesn't want a new exchange with the West. A nuclear exchange. He, he doesn't want a war with NATO, but it's every time we escalate, you know, with high Mars and then with storm shadow weapons and then, you know, the Patriot system before then, um, it doesn't work. You know, every time that they, they make a new counter offensive, you know, the Ukrainian counter offensive in the south is just falling flat. It's not working. Then there was this coup at the weekend with the Wagner Group and uh, all the, the the Western narrators thought, oh, this is great. There's going to be a regime change. But that actually turned out to be to Russia's advantage because they've been redeployed in the north and so on. So um, everything that the West does and NATO does is falling flat, you, mm -hmm. you know, both militarily and economically, I mean, the sanctions that they placed on Russia are not hurting Russia. They're actually benefiting Russia because Europe's not buying oil from Russia, but it is because it's buying uh, Russian oil that has gone to China, turned into LNG, put on a boat to Rotterdam, and then we're buying it that way. So, you know, the Russians are making more money, the Chinese are making money, and uh, the West, or Europe in particular, is uh, losing out. So, um, yeah... I mean, in terms of where this is going, I, I think that now uh, people in America in particular who are key are just fed up of it. You know, the, the American public is questioning this now and saying why they've had total military propaganda thrown at them. We need to do this for freedom and democracy. But they're questioning why are we sending money and weapons when our own country is in such a mess. I mean, that's what yeah. Americans are saying. That's what, what British people are saying outside the London media bubble as well. It's what Germans are saying. There's protests in Germany against the war, saying Russia is our friend, but you've got um, Stolz and Baerbach, these crazies in the German um, Bundestag, stoking up war. You know, you've got this green foreign minister in Germany who's actually wanting to provoke more war. It, the whole thing is just... You, you know, you, you couldn't make it up, to be honest. But, it's, uh, it's 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 uh, like the uh, <laughs> well, I, I mean, it's almost like the the lunatics have taken over the asylum, or the clowns are in charge of the circus, isn't it? I, I mean, the money that Sunak has just allocated within the last week, he's just allocated another hundred and fifty million pounds for housing for Ukrainian refugees. You know, people in this country are finding their food bills are increasing, inflation, energy bills, fuel prices. People are struggling, and yet all they see is a, a, a WEF puppet prime minister in the form of Sunak, who's unelected and unwanted. He was being rejected by his own party, yet he's still there doing all of these things. And of course, you're right. We've got a big American audience um, on this channel, and they've woken up to the fact that this whole thing in Ukraine and the billions of pounds and the billions of dollars that are going over there, it, it, it might little be little more than a money laundering scam. And let's not forget Joe Biden, his son, and what's been going on there as well. Mm. And just talking about that, um, I, I think I suspect I know what the answer is. But um, do do you do you think, uh, or would you like to see Trump back in uh, the running for twenty twenty four in the United States? Yeah, I well, anyone's better than Biden, isn't it? I I think I I personally think Trump won in 2020 you know i stood up and i said that i said there's uh you know there's obviously um discrepancies and, and things which are questionable about the vote counting uh, he, he he clearly i think he, he won but you know it, history is is what it is but in 2024 yeah i mean i would like to see trump back or you know kennedy uh for the democrats is coming through he seems to be fairly sensible as well. I think I would agree more with Trump's policies than Kennedy's policies, but he's making lots of good sounds, you know, and uh, for someone on the left, he's far more sensible than Biden. 
he would end the Ukraine war, he wouldn't impose lockdowns and so on. The thing I don't like about Kennedy is still into all of the climate alarmism and net zero, so he would still carry on with that, whereas Trump wouldn't. You know, he would end net zero and go back to, you know, energy reality, <laughs> which is what we really need. Because that is the thing, coming back to an earlier thing you said, that is one of the major things that is causing economic chaos all over the West mm. is this adherence to climate ideology and the war on coal, oil, gas and cars, etc. You know, and then this yeah. whole program of, of, of climate alarmism is, is, is just such a drag on the economy because energy prices go up completely unnecessarily mm -hmm. and then that feeds into everything. The price of everything then goes up which causes, of course, hardship and scarcity when there is an abundance. Um, so it's these governments <coughs> are turning abundance into scarcity by their stupid policies of net zero. Mm. So we need to get out of that. And of course, on top of that, the other reason why there is um, a lot of hardship and economic turmoil is because of the whole lockdown period where they spent hundreds of billions on you know, paying people to stay at home and not work, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that, crazy, that's obviously crazy. going to cause economic chaos. Yeah, I mean, well, just going back something, I mean, I agree, and I'm, I'm just going back to, to Robert Kennedy, I mean, I actually quite like him. Um, uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's not faint, faint praise. I, I like a lot of, of things about him. He's asked all the right questions about COVID. He's asked a lot of questions about the vaccine injuries, and he's he's been doing a good job. Somebody who is an American... Uh, suggested uh, quite recently that what, I wonder what would happen to the deep state and the establishment in America if if Kennedy was to run with Trump as his, you know or, or or to be Trump's running mate. Boy, that would be a, a turn up for the books, wouldn't it? That would be incredible, wouldn't it? That that <laughs> would probably be the best possible thing for the United States. <laughs> but it might, it might actually be the unifying factor for the United States, mightn't it? It could be. I mean, I've never thought of that before, but that, that is some idea, isn't it? Because yeah. you, you'd have basically, you'd have the best of the right and the best of the left together. Exactly. And, exactly. you know, that, that could be incredible. And, and you know me. Yeah, yeah. I like it. Yeah, I like it. Well, 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 I tell you, you, you know, my, my experience with the Brexit party and the left was, was a good one. You know, it was really positive. There are some sensible people around the middle, some on the left, some on the right. And if you can try to overcome that or find that sort of common uh, denominator, it can really work quite powerfully. Now, my audience uh, know what my feelings are on uh, dystopian controls. They know I'm a freedom fighter and a truth seeker, much like yourself, David. And uh, it wouldn't be right if I wasn't to sort of ask you the question, have you been to Davos to see Klaus Schwab? I have never been to Davos and I've never met Klaus Schwab. I'm sorry to say, I, I, I hope I don't, <laughs> you know, I don't think it's something that I'm ever going to go to. I don't think it's something they'll even let me into now that I've nailed my colours to the mast, if you like. But no, I mean, we are the only UK party that specifically says if you've been a member of the WEF, you cannot join the Heritage Party. They're on our proscribed list of organizations from which you can't uh, join along with you know the national front and so on and the bilderberg group and, and things so like that so you you, so, you you've actually formalized that you've actually stated that have you yeah yeah we, wow. we have a list of you know I, every party yeah. has a list of prescribed organizations you know so we we don't want the 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 real ethno-nationalist groups, you know, the kind of people that would mm. say, I'm not British because of the colour mm. of my skin. We don't mm. want people like that to come into the party. Um, but we, we've also added um, left-wing and globalist groups to our prescribed list. So we, we've added Antifa, uh, the Fabian Society, the Bilderberg Group, the World Economic Forum, Stonewall, and a couple of others to say, if you've been in any of these organizations, you cannot join the Heritage Party. So, well, that's yeah, tremendous. I, I, I think a lot of people will be very relieved to hear that because I see increasing amount, amounts of people saying, politicians, if they've got any kind of WEF affiliation, they shouldn't be near parliament because they're serving a corporate globalist agenda. They're not serving the interests of the British people or the British establishment. And it's the same applies for America as well. Your heart has to be with your own country, 
and with your own people. So that's tremendous to hear, David. I'm really pleased. Look, time is running away. I, I, it always feels like five minutes when I'm having fun, especially with amazing guests like you. But in the last sort of two, two, three minutes, David, I want to give you the floor and I want to give you the opportunity to say whatever you want to say to the, to the audience. And uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you. I mean, look, I got into this because I think we have a fantastic country, the United Kingdom, you know, with, with all of our history and our heritage. But it's clearly, you know, I, I, I just thought a few years ago, I, you know, it's, it's a, a, a realisation that something is very, very badly wrong. And I think a lot of people have got that understanding now. And looking into it, you've basically got cultural Marxism, you've got the woke agenda, you've got the climate agenda, you've got the LGBT activists, you've got Black Lives Matter activists, you've got toxic feminism, not not equal equality of opportunity, but the kind of feminism that says men are bad and, and all men should be in jail, you know, even if they um, <laughs> make a bit of banter about something, you know, there's the attack on free speech. And we've got to do something about it because if we don't everything that we know and hold dear and has been given to us by our forefathers will have gone you know every generation has to fight for freedom and this is our fight now and it's not a fight where we have to go to normandy and lay down our lives and, and get shot out in blood but it is uh, we have to stand up and be prepared to put our reputations on the line and right now you know some people some of us are getting arrested and are getting thrown out of our jobs and are having our bank accounts closed. We're at that point. But if we don't stand up now and fight against it, it's going to get worse and there'll be nothing left. So please, if you're watching, come and join me in the Heritage Party. You can do that at heritageparty.org. I want to change our country and make it right again, but I can't do it on my own. Um, we have... Uh, you know thousands of people uh, who are supporters of the heritage party and 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 members and candidates we need more though we need more people to join us to make a ground swell a movement to put our country right so please join me as a member as a candidate as a supporter and uh you know now's the time to get off um the fence and take action so please do that well, David, uh, powerful, powerful words, and clearly you are a powerful uh, proponent of political punditry, but you are also taking things to the next level. You've stood up, you're, you're being counted, and people are most certainly noticing you and your party. And David, I'd just like to say it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today, this afternoon, and I would very much invite you back again, if you're willing. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, it's been great to join you and I'd love to come back again. There's so much more to talk about. There's only so much we can cover in a short space of time, but there is so much more to talk about, David. Thank you so much indeed. And for, for all of the people out there who are watching, thank you. You are the beating heart of this channel. It's thanks to you and people like you that are getting us millions and millions of views out there. We are a modest channel, but my goodness, when you act in the way that you do, we get the message out. And always remember, as the world gets darker, we get brighter. So thank you to you. And David, my sincere thanks to you. This is Jim thanks Ferguson. This is Jim Ferguson. And we'll speak soon. Bye-bye.